is a, um, an Evanston resident and who works really hard on issues of uh, race and equity and also on, on gun violence issues. Um, and Carla, we met, I remember about two years ago, we met right on the corner, we're at Gibbs Morrison right now, and we met on the corner of Church and Dodge about two years ago. Do you remember my sign? It's not enough to race against hate. I said you have to race towards equity. And um, ever since then, our paths have crossed. Mm -hmm many many times so we both went to springfield to uh, lobby for uh, sensible gun laws with moms demand action and you facilitate the dear Everson racial justice book group um so we have a lot in common in terms of our goals of um pushing for equity and recognizing racism in where we live in evanston no. um another thing that we have in common is that we're both immigrants mm -hmm. and where we differ in, in being immigrants is where we're actually from. So, you, and the I perspective we bring. Coming and the perspective we bring, <laughs> absolutely. And I remember you telling me that growing up in Trinidad, racism just wasn't anything on your mind because everyone pretty much was black. Or well, black or Indian. Black or Indian. Yeah, and we do have a smaller percent of Chinese, um, and there's some influx from Venezuela, uh, just being so close. but. Um, some Syrian, mix of everything. And so it wasn't only that racism wasn't a thing, but race just wasn't a thing that was spoken of. And right. I think I can best describe that as, um, you know, if you were in, a, in Iceland or, you know, Trump's favorite, Norway, right? right? And you wanted to describe somebody over there, you wouldn't say, oh, the white girl, right. you know, because right. everybody's, everybody's white. white. Um, and so similarly in Trinidad, everybody's brown of some sort. I mean, quite frankly, I said it the other day, like, even our white folks are tan because it's hot all day, right? So they don't look like the folks here per se. Right. Um, and so everybody's some shade of brown, and so we just didn't talk about it. It went. It was so un, you know, unremarkable. And on that, on, on my side, I grew up in South Africa, mm -hmm. where race was the one and only issue that pretty much that defined. My country. childhood and, what and the think country. About it, it's just South Africa back then. And so it's very interesting because then you came to the states. When did you come to the states? At seventeen. At seventeen, mm -hmm. and you came to go to university. University of Mississippi, of all places. Of all fine places. <laughs> and is that when you, your eyes were opened to? No, they okay. remained shut for a long time. Okay. Um, if you grow up with a certain set of truths, right? I grew up in a country where race is not a thing people don't treat you badly because of your race. Now, people might treat you badly, but that's because they're having a bad day or they're just mean. Um, right. you, you, it's, you can't just break that in a second. Again, I went to Mississippi in 1997. It's not like there were race riots and, you know, right. <laughs> um, that kind of stuff. You're, uh, it's, it was still more subtle. And so I'm seeing things happening around me, but it is not in my life experience to associate that with race. Um, the couple of things were obviously different. I that back then described it as self-segregation. I was like, why all the black people sitting on this side of the cafeteria? Why all the white people? What's up with these, these sororities and fraternities? Which there is not one organization that I knew, I can't say one doesn't exist today, 20 years later in Trinidad, but as a kid growing up, there was not one organization I knew that you could join because of the color of your skin. It just didn't exist. And in fact, I was given a full scholarship to Tuskegee in Alabama because I wanted to first, first I wanted to study aeronautic engineering I ended up settling for mechanical, but um, I had a full scholarship from Dusky in Alabama and I turned it down because it was a black co uh, university. And I didn't understand the concept of any organization, because again, we don't study American history, that is, you can join just because of the color of your skin. And so I opened the brochure and it says best black this and this black that, and I'm thinking to myself, I don't want to be the best black anything. I just want to be the best. <laughs> like I don't understand, right, right. right? Because I don't. We didn't have a history of being excluded. We got our independence. Our first president was black. Like our presidents, our prime ministers, my teachers, my principals, you know, were black, black or Indian or brown, or, you know, right. some sort. And so I didn't understand being excluded because you were black. So when did it? Occur? When did you suddenly say, "Whoa"? And I don't think there could be a suddenly. Um, because it just the pieces, you have to erase a whole life experience before that, 17 years. Um, and so... As did I. Yes. <laughs> so there were little bits. I think um, I looked at myself as a black person in my mind. I told myself as many, I see it in so many immigrants today who are in here for a shorter time. They're like, look, I'm in control of my own destiny. Nobody can, 
you know, keep me back. I'm, I'm gonna step out of that race stuff. I, I'm not sure what they're about over there. And I am just gonna do my own thing, keep my head down, do the right thing, and I will get followed. And it was not going to affect me. <laughs> and so there was a, a, a determination to turn a blind eye to it because I was like, I didn't want to get involved. I was there, <laughs> I was on a scholarship, I need to keep my scholarship, I need to get my degree and get working and make some money, period. Um, and so um, I think one of the first conversations I had that this started to click for me was not even about race. I was driving down Lakeshore Drive and a friend of mine um, said that uh, I saw some homeless people on the street and I, and I just uh, right, right along, they tend to sleep along Lakeshore Drive sometimes and I thought to myself, you know, I'm not saying that I couldn't be homeless. I'm like there, but for the grace of God, go any of us, right? But I just, I have this feeling that I'd get out of it. Like I would just get out of it. And my friend looked at me and she said, you are bringing your experience, your set of skills, your achievements to that problem. And assuming that if you put yourself as you are today in that situation, you will get out. And she's like, no doubt you will get out. But now take somebody else's life experience. Parents who didn't support them, parents who didn't grow up to tell them they could be anything, a society that didn't support them, <laughs> a society that constantly told them they weren't anything, somebody who's been to war, somebody who has mental illness, somebody, like you're putting your set of circumstances there. And in that statement, which was again, not about race, I almost understood instantaneously that because of my set of experience as a black person, we're not the same as African Americans, in a, that they were experiencing something totally different than the way I was moving through coming here at 17. Right. And that was the connection that didn't even start with race, that kind of so opened it up and made it happen for me. So it's sort of like an aha moment that then led you down the path yeah. that you're going. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit to me about coming to the States at the age of 17 as a black woman, seeing that African-Americans, you're not African-American, mm -hmm. you see African-Americans at one table and whites at another table. Where did you sit? With the international students. <laughs> so all of my friends from college are international, from Serbia, from Jamaica, from um, Malaysia, anywhere else but America. From an African-American standpoint, I didn't seem right. <laughs> I spoke differently. <laughs> I didn't hold the same values. Um, uh, many of the folks were first generation um, college students and so they dressed to the hilt to go to class. And I was, you know, I watched TV. I saw how kids went to college. I was in my pajama pants, like slushing along. And they were like, you're not holding up the image. I'm like, what image? I, I don't know. Did I sign a contract about an image that I was supposed to have? So you, so you didn't understand African-Americans and they didn't, they didn't understand, understand me. You. They um, didn't see you as, they saw you as black but other. Yes, or trying to be white, or because if it's be not, white. especially in the South, where they're, at least in Mississippi, there's not a huge population of Hispanic or Asian or right. other, it's black or white, and black comes in for them in kind of one form. And, and so the I didn't white students? Um, you know, a little bit of the exoticizing. Oh, that's so cool. And, you know, the ignorant statements. You know, I had a girl tell me once, um, you must have the most awesome bikinis in Trinidad. And I was like, yeah, you should see my Sunday church bikini. Like, yeah. like, how did you boil my country down to bikinis? Like, what and, is wrong with you? And so you're very involved in the community. You've lived in Evanston for how long? Six years. For six years. And what brought you to Evanston? Having kids, you know, looking for schools, choosing. For us, it was immediately about Evanston versus Oak Park because we wanted to, you know, quote unquote, like everybody else, diverse community. Um, and. Uh, you know, ultimately the Evanston one because of the lake and it was closer to Andersonville where we lived previously and right. where still a good number of our friends were. And before, uh, before we talk about your um, community involvement, let me ask you about your family. So you're married mm -hmm. and you have two kids and you're a mixed race family. Yeah, we're a mixed race, same gender family. Uh, with adopted kids, you know, so anything else we want to throw in there? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> immigrants. <laughs> uh, from that perspective, Evanston, has been great just you know just from being who we are and having it be okay and people not bad an eyelid um i mean they might be talking but no not my concern right. um, but to me anyway right, right, right. um it hasn't been an issue and then when in if you, you were here for six years when did you decide you were going to become um involved in activism and and race issues i think um you know my kids in general have been the catalyst for me there was a point of realizing that this is different, realizing that there's systems in this country, realizing there's a history that still impacts today. But that wasn't enough before to kind of make me think that I need to make this a focus in my life. 
Um, once I had kids, I realized I had to do some learning of how to raise black children in this country. My mother didn't have to have the talk with me. My mother didn't have to tell me about what my skin meant and how my skin impacted people when they saw me in the world. Those are not conversations we had. So I had to study up pretty quickly to understand what it would take for me to raise my kids. And the more I looked and the more I saw how things impacted my kids. And when you look at your child and she's in pain because something was innocently said, but it doesn't have an innocent impact on her. And, um, it made me realize that I had to do work to make sure the people around her were understanding the impact that their words have and were also working to watch change. It's interesting, so even though you, know, you yourself walk around in a black skin, mm -hmm. you had to learn, almost like a white person has mm -hmm. to learn to be anti-racist. Yes, that's actually the main point of my book. It's because I think I have the unique experience of understanding blackness as an outsider in this country, which is the path that I would love all white people to go on, <laughs> of understanding what it means to be black in this country. It is not about the color of your skin. Um, and I had to do that as an adult. And so I feel like I have some insight into what it takes to make that journey even, I mean, I, a little extra insight, right? Because you, I got to experience it in some ways, Absolutely. but I, I got to make that cognitive shift as an adult. And what, so tell me about your book. I'll I knew you were writing a book, but I didn't realize that was what it was about. Yes, so um, it's a little bit about me coming here and, and the dichotomy of black in Trinidad versus black here, um, as well as sort of my awakening and what I have learned and the key pieces that I think that have made the shift for me that I'm hoping will help make the shift for others. It was having kids that sent you on this journey, mm -hmm. and then as, as we, I said before, we've been involved in a lot of things together, um, but one of the things that you've just done um, is started this this group called Evanston Skokie Parents, Parents. Parents Against Racism. Mm -hmm. for, committed, and, committed, committed to, to Anti-Racism. Anti -racism. Yes. And um, I know right now you have about 274 people on, mm -hmm. the, on the group, but it started like a month ago. Yeah. Well, talk a little bit about the goals of the group, what you hope to get out of it, what mm -hmm. you hope other people get out of it. Um, so, looking at other Facebook groups in, in, in Evanston as a parent here that we all kind of go to for whatever our various needs are, um, it was very clear to me that it, what was created by default was not a place or safe space for people of color. Um, and you can tell that because you could look on, you could see people of color there, but the conversation and the voices that are heard, it, it, you know, it, it leaves out <laughs> that, it doesn't leave out intentionally but it creates a space where people of color, like if I put my toe in that, it's not. So yeah, sure, they might comment on, you know, anybody's got a good handyman, right? right? That's a safe right. space. Right. But they're not going to share anything from their lives because the, the sense is that it's not going to be understood. Um, and, you know, you could look at those and be in those all day long and not realize that if you are not looking with a lens. <laughs> if you're looking with a white lens, you may not even realize that we're not hearing the voices. Right. Um, and so we had two goals, to create a space where we were educating all parents um, to educate the kids about race and racism. So, so the, I mean, it has to start with the parent getting knowledge first, and then we're constant. And but it's a continuous, right? You can go to one training. It's like the sex talk these days. Back in the day, I told you had your sex talk with your kid, and it was over. Great. You know about the birds and bees. See ya. Um, now they tell you you have to have it all the time. Similarly with race, you have to start having it from the time the kid could talk all the way up, there are different complications when that kid is 16 or 17. You have to keep having it all along. And so it was meant to be an ongoing, so instead of just like looking at a video and saying, oh, look at that racist over there in that video, how do you see parallels in what's happening today for us? Or look at this article, look at these three pieces. Share this little video with your child. Talk to them about what they see, what they notice. Um, and it's kind of a constant ping for parents to do some own self-reflection and to make connections with their kids on different things, but as well as creating a safe space for people of color, which I think one of the most um, rewarding things, which you know, we, somebody just posted a thank you yesterday um, on the site, is seeing people of color come up with their stories and knowing that they're not gonna get, like, why are you being so sensitive? Like, why is that a thing? Race has nothing to do with that. Like, why are you making this a thing? That they're going, their, their voices are going to be listened to and acknowledged in this group. And I've seen several people be willing and brave enough to share that story and know that it will be welcomed and that means the world to me. Right. And that's, um, 
from my perspective with, with Gary Evanston is elevating stories like that. So, because often those stories are not heard mm -hmm. because they are not and told. And not validated. And I they're mean, not validated. And they're not validated. Like, if you right. post about your experience and then see, you know, or nothing. She's just complaining. Or, or, or nothing. So, so, like, or nothing. And nothing right. to it. Right. That's a second hurt on top of the first hurt that happened. And so for people of color to know that they have a space that they can go share their frustration, their frustration would be validated. Um, and you know, nobody's gonna solve your problems. We can't, you know, one person can't solve your problems, but just say, I hear you. Thank you for sharing that. So the interesting thing about the group then is that on the one hand, you're trying to educate parents about racism and anti-racism so that they can talk to their kids. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you're focusing specifically on people of color feeling comfortable. So what about white parents who um, may be at the beginning of their journey, the anti-racism journey, um, are they welcome to the group or is it specifically a group for people of color? No, it's a group for everybody. You said on one hand and the other hand and I will say these two hands are clasped because and, and this is why it's it's a hard um, page to moderate because if there are things called white affinity groups um, which sounds like a weird word that word took a while to get to me because right. you have images of KKK but it's not that right. it's actually a space so that uh, white people can go and talk and question and figure out and grapple with this use of race without saying offensive things that hurt can hurt people of color right. hearing it over and over and over how right. you don't get it right, right? Um, and so if you think that you still have some some just general basics you need to grapple with a white affinity group which one does exist uh, at Nichols uh, may be a good place for you because you're like I want to be able to say these things um, so, but if you want white parents to be able to learn about the experience of people of color and kids of color in this community, they can't learn about that firsthand from other white people. You know, I always encourage, we're doing White Fragility soon by Robin D'Angelo, um, and I encourage, I love that book, it's filled with so much science and um, she studied it and she studied for years, but we have a lot of books out there talking about race from a PhD perspective. Right from a doctorate in what it means to be black by a white person. Correct. You know there are other great books. Um, so you want to talk about race by Ijoma, blanking her last name right now. But um, that is a perspective of what it means to be black by a black person. She doesn't have a PhD, but she didn't have. A, she, she has a life PhD in being right. black. Right. And so we have to balance having people of color in the room to share their experience, so it could be fully understood by white people. But at the same time, not have people say things that are then going to be offensive and punish the people of color for sharing their experience. And so, you know, we have a rule in our site that there's no tone policing and there's no diversionary tactics, meaning somebody shares their story or shares, you know, serious issues about race and you nitpick on a piece of humor here or you nitpick on it wasn't said with the right tone. The point is, we're here to be about anti racism. And if you want to talk about something else, this is not the place for it. So if you want to that, that take away from the conversation of anti-racism, then um, that's not going to be welcome. And so it is a fine line to walk, but those are not two hands. It has to be together because you can't get a full understanding without people of color in the room. So would you encourage, um, would you encourage Evanstonians who are interested in not only people who are already invested, but people who are looking to become mm -hmm. invested, would you encourage them to join your group? I would encourage them to join your group. I'll tell, encourage them to read the rules and I'll encourage them to listen for a while. Listen, see how other people are, um, the tone is set differently in this group than Got just it. a random other group. And so to look, look how people are communicating and see we're, we're fighting really hard to create a certain type of community in here. You talked about coming to the States and learning about, uh, about the divide, the racial divide. And one of the things, and I came to the States, and from my perspective, thought I was coming to a Nirvana mm -hmm. uh, compared to South Africa, and then I learned about the racial mm -hmm. divide. Um, and one of the things that I learned pretty recently when I was in Leadership Evanston, um, one of my friends at Leadership Evanston, Melissa Blunt, I interviewed her for Dear Evanston, and she told me that the problem with race was white supremacy, and I nearly fell off the chair. Mm -hmm. As much as I was already on the journey, and I worked at the Anti-Defamation League as, as a, in my 20s, so white supremacy to me was the KKK, mm -hmm. it was, you know, the Michigan militia, it was really virulent, out there, white racist groups. And for me to learn the word white supremacy 
and understand it as an institutionalized issue was such a big leap mm -hmm. and it made and it put everything into a perspective for me to understand mm -hmm. and I think that so many white people who want to walk the walk of being anti-racist or at least want to try to understand it get very turned off by that word mm -hmm. and I think as it becomes more used um, and reframed mm -hmm. um, I think that's a really important step and, and a step to, to, to say to white people it's about institutional racism it's about the very foundations of this country mm -hmm. it does it's not about it, it's also about the extremists. There is probably an unconscious desire to keep it as being about the extremists. So everybody could say, yes, those, it's, it's all me. racism is because of those few bad people over there. It's not. And I'm not participating and absolutely. I'm not gaining from it and I don't want this. Um, and I just wrote, wrote a piece that was called Redefining Racism and uh, White Supremacy. Redefining your limited view of racism and white That's supremacy. Right. And it's speak and in teaching, I, I do I teach classes on uh, race and racism. And in teaching, I found that the word the use of the word white supremacy um, as a description of our society, a white supremacist society, was the one thing that even in a room of people who were you know fairly far along on their journey. Um, meaning, and this journey is a never-ending journey. It's not like you get to get a certificate at the end and be like, "I get it, I'm right. woke now." Right. Um, but they were, you know, they had been doing work. When that word was used, I could see the eyebrows go up. Like, what are you talking about, Willis? Like, and it's a societal thing. We have all bought into it, including black people or different uh, people of different races. Um, and so. In the piece I wrote, I saw a video of kids of a very young age being showed two That's colored right. dolls. That's right. And you have young kids who have gone, they didn't grow up in, um, you know, KKK families, where even black kids are saying, that's the pretty doll, pointing to the white doll, or that's the smart doll, um, and that's the mean doll, pointing to the black doll. And so they're getting it because it's everywhere. Um, and, you know, my, my, the key questions I kind of asked in that is, what race is considered? Primarily beauty. What is the me what is the media sharing as what standard of beauty is? Who's considered the girl next door? Do you consider a little Korean girl? <laughs> you know, like do you ever? Does that pop to mind when you say girl next door? Um, who's considered non-threatening? Or who's considered threatening? Um, and so, if you ask these questions, and the answer is always white, and the white the answer for many people of color sometimes is always white. Um, especially for those who grew up in a predominantly white or more white community. Um, if, you, you know, if you live in a predominantly black community, it may not always be that way. Um, but, uh, yeah, we have all bought in. We've all bought in. I think it's interesting, I just finished reading Michelle Obama's book mm -hmm. and she talks about growing up on the South Side and um, feeling like her community was great and fine and she loved it. and. Then she went to school, she took a bus to school to Whitney Young mm -hmm. and she had to take it through downtown Chicago and then she just saw this whole different world mm -hmm. um, that woke her up to that it's you know, when when you grow up when you grow up in your own community, that's mm -hmm. the norm. Yeah. Um, and I think that unfortunately that's also the norm for people who grow up in um, low income, disadvantaged communities it's so difficult to get out of that because that's your norm. Mm -hmm. you, you, you can't see further than where you're at. Yeah. You, don't, and you, it's, it, you don't have as many examples. You I think that was one of the opening. I volunteered and taught robotics um, at a school in Inglewood many, many years ago, high school. And I remember the first day I went to speak to the kids about the robotic competition and the scholarships available and I'm there excited and I bought pizza and kids were coming in the room grabbing pizza and walking out. Because when I told them that there were scholarships available to go to college, I could have as well been telling them they could go to Mars. Exactly. You know, like it just, exactly. and I, you know, I was so naive. No, I was naive yeah. <laughs> to the realities of, you know, who these kids were, because I grew up poor. And, but I had examples of people. My uncle went to college, my neighbors went to college, my neighbor's sons went to college. There were people around me. And is that because of the country you grew up in? Without a systemic and institutionalized system keeping people of a certain color down, then it is more of, it's, it's, nothing's perfect, right? But more of an even playing field where you feel like I am in control of my own destiny. If I study, if I work hard, that couldn't be my ticket out because there are not other factors working against me. 
And so I was 13 when I decided I was getting out of there one way or the other. And I didn't have a plan. We sure didn't have the money to send me to college. <laughs> and my first plan was being a, a flight attendant because that's the first way I figured I could get off the island. What made you at 15 decide you wanted out of there? I got cable. <laughs> Seriously? Similarly to Michelle Obama leaving her small community and going to Whitney Young and seeing down like a whole different world downtown. Um, you know, until I was like 11 or 12, we had one station, then we got two. And I was watching a lot of Matlock and Golden Girls and LA Law and you know all of that stuff. Katni and Lacey. Only the three shows that showed that night. That was it. Um, and then once we got cable, suddenly you know, and it's like. <laughs> not legal. I mean, we were paying legally, but I right. however it works, they so you got like 200 stations. Like, it was just like, whoosh, everything. And that's why I encouraged that. Sort well, of suddenly I saw a whole world and I was like, what? All of that is out here? Wow. <laughs> and so I just wanted, I didn't necessarily at the mo that moment want to come to America. I wanted to see the world. I mean, there's so much stuff out there. Um, and I figured a flight attendant, you can do it. All you need is a high school degree. You need to speak another language. And I was studying French and Spanish. Um, and back then, there were all these sexist rules, so I had heard and knew you had to be tall and beautiful and thin, and I was like, okay, oh, gotta, gotta lose a little bit of weight. Uh, <laughs> and that was my quickest, easiest, non-money-needing you know, money needing way to get off the island. Interestingly enough, when I was growing up in South Africa, there was no TV, mm -hmm. and the reason that there was no TV is South Africa, the government, didn't want people to see, to see what's, going on, what's going on outside. And I, we got TV when I was 14. And to, that's what allowed me to dream and to that, think I wanted something beyond. Talk a little bit too, for me about your work with District 65. I'm not working as a whole with District 65, although um, we have six schools that are sponsoring a training that I'm doing next week. Um, this coming Saturday, right? It's, it's maybe four days away now. Um, called uh, Teaching, Talking to Kids, How to Talk to Kids About Race and Racism. Um, and I, you know, I specifically named it Race and Racism because we always think race and we think negative. There's so many lovely, joyous pieces of race and culture and things to celebrate. But today, when we say race in America, we're like, oh, boy. Right. Um, and so um, I, I originally started to um, plan that class for Dewey, uh, which is a school my kids go to, um, because there's been a rash of uh, racist rhetoric going on. Um, but we know that's happening. Among the children? Schools, among the, the children and the right. younger group of children. Um, and so um, people reached out from other schools saying, hey, we would love to be part of this as well. Um, so we reached out to the PTAs and it's now being sponsored by six different schools. And so and the district has taken on and they shared it in their Fast Five and they're supportive of this work because again, um, it is the responsibility of the district to have a clear policy and a way of dealing with these incidents when they happen. But these incidents are not created by the district, to be fair. Now they can be perpetuated if they're not like addressed, addressed right? Um, but these cases used are created at home um, and not in the same ways that everybody thinks. I am a firm believer that none of the things that, ha that were said in our school was because a parent sat and taught those kids that. What a parent didn't do was explicitly tell their kid there's a clear difference between the word stupid and the n-word. Or stupid and calling a black child a monkey. And um, if we don't clearly teach our kids what those words are and how they need to stay away from them, they're gonna hear it used one day somewhere and they're gonna hear it used in a mean way as a burn as they would say these days and they're gonna think it's just like any other burn out there and they're gonna use it because they heard it in a mean tone and they want to be mean in this moment and all kids are mean. <laughs> at some point in time. Right. They want to be mean in this moment without realizing the extra weight that that carries. And I had somebody tell me the other day, oh, well, all our kids, kids have been bullied. All our kids have been mean things. And I was like, don't, not for one second, tell me. Quite. Yeah, calling a kid a mean word like stupid or, you know, is the same thing. They're protected classes in this country for a reason. So we're happy to see that the district is standing behind the work that we're doing. And you, you said that there's been a recent rash of um, slurs uh, thrown around by children. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it a new phenomenon or has it been going on for a long time and we're just sort of more aware and uh, wanting to address this stuff? You know, I honestly don't know. My kids are in second grade. I have not been in the school, well, second grade in, in kindergarten. I have been in the school system long enough. I am sure it is not the first time this has been said. But what I, I, I'm positive right now, especially I can speak for our school at Dewey, 
there's a set of PTA parents and parents in general, we're not gonna sit by and, and, and just let this continue. They're gonna take action. I was just wondering whether, it, you know, maybe there's been exacerbation of it, just like there has been with anti-Semitism um, and racism around the country and mm -hmm. anti-Muslim sentiment around the country because of, because of our current national leadership. Mm -hmm. so and there are all sorts of levels of it, right? There was one of the comments made was that all black people are stupid. Right. There was a, a kid. Yeah, comment. that is not. Hey, I called you a monkey, and I didn't really know the history of the, you know, whatever. Right. Um, that's a clear statement. That again, if you don't talk to your kids, which I am not purporting that the that kid heard there. There's a statistic that says by the age of five, kids will have already picked up racial biases, and they don't always line up with the thinking of their parents. So right. they don't have a con it's not like they can see different right. color skin. They've already picked right. up biases. Right. Between three and five, they figure out that people are treated differently by the color of their skin. And so they follow suit. And so they follow suit, right? And so unless you are counteracting what society is giving like oxygen, you're gonna end up with a kid who's gonna say the wrong thing. So talk to me a little bit about implicit bias. Implicit bias is, you know, these prejudices that we pick up unaware that we're even taking them in. For instance, if you live in a, a community where the people you see serving um, are brown and black people, the people who are working in the lunchroom, the people who serve you when you go to a restaurant, the people who serve you if you go to McDonald's, wherever, you're starting to slowly pick up, marry that, that certain people are in service, and then you marry that with who's the principal of my school? What do most of the teachers look like? What are, you know, what does the president look like? You're starting to pick up, oh, all the people in power <laughs> look like a certain thing. And that quickly, repeatedly, repeatedly, different examples then tell you that it's built a different way. And you may, and you're not even aware of it. And you're not even aware that your, your brain is processing these pieces of information. I think what, what I would say to anybody who's interested in doing this work, one of the first things you need to learn, and it's the thing I put in every one of the trainings I do, how to apologize when you make a bad step. It's like you don't know what you don't know. I can't tell you how many things I said when I first came to this country that were, you know, very prejudiced at the very least, because I just didn't know what I didn't know. And so, um, and you could be woke to a point Wokish, you know, they should start a new show instead of blackish, wokish. Um, and then there's another nuance. Racism is, is deep, and hence the layers of the ways you can step in it are deep. And so if you, anybody dedicating themselves to this work needs to understand that I'm going to step in it. And when I do, even if I don't understand how yet, and I, that wasn't in my intention, and I repeat all the time, racism is not about the intention with which the thing was said or done, it's the impact that it had on the oppressed group or the person of color. It is not about the intention. And so regardless of your intentions going into it, it's just learning to say, you know what, that was my bad. Right. And I mean, nothing diffuses a situation like, dude, An apology. my bad, I own that. Well, you can't drop the N-word and then say my bad, right? <laughs> my right. Bad. I mean, well, as an adult. Well, I was thinking about how we open our, our training um, this week is, you know, if parents are here just so they don't get embarrassed um, when their kid is the next kid to drop the N-word, you know, they're here because it, it's, to me, this is not 1970. <laughs> the goals, the goals here are not about keeping the, you know, not saying the N-word or not saying a slur. That is not the ultimate right. goal. Been there, done that. Yeah, this is 2019, we are so past this. My goal is making sure that the kids that my my daughters are surrounded by are gonna have their back. Not only not gonna call them the N-word, that is, that is the least of my problems. Right, right. right? That's the lowest, That's the, the lowest, lowest bar. bar. But when my kids are 12 and they're playing and a cop comes by, that that white kid's not gonna take off and go running. That, that white kid understands that the mere presence next to my black child changes the outcome, makes the outcome better. And so that is why I do the work that I do. That is why, because if my kids, gonna, kids are gonna grow up in a community that's majority white, those better be some progressive and truly progressive, not progressive, full stop, I moved to Evanston, I'm progressive, right. but constantly on the journey, constantly pushing forward and have my kids back.